Hello, Deb. How you doing? I see you. We're going to get started here uh, in just a couple minutes. Um, I'm going to try to wait for a couple people to log in. We're going to have an awesome time tonight. I hope Tim is sitting right beside you with his ankle up. Danny, I see you. I hope your, your leg is up as well, Danny. Amen. We're going to have a good time tonight. We're, we're still in Unit 8. We're still in Unit 8, and we're going to talk about something. Um, uh, we're going to talk about uh, being totally dependent on God tonight. So it's going to be a good time. Amen. So we'll give it just a couple more minutes and. Well, not even a couple more minutes, maybe another minute or so, and then we're going to pray and just uh, jump right into the word tonight. And then those um, who won't see it, they can just pick up the video um, either on YouTube or see it on Facebook. Kanayo, how you doing? I see you. Hey, man. So in experiencing God, we're on we're on day five um, and it's talking about we're going to be talking about being totally dependent on God and what that looks like. And have you ever been totally dependent? Just a question. Have you ever been totally dependent on someone? Um, totally dependent on someone for your decision making totally dependent on someone for providing food or providing clothing or providing shelter? Have you been totally dependent on someone for providing validation or peace or happiness? Have you ever been totally dependent on someone to, uh, for the breath that you breathe or being totally dependent for the heartbeat? inside of you and that's what we're going to discuss today the need for our total dependence on God there's a song that uh, I was listening to earlier today from Elevation Worship that says narrow is the road it seems follow where your spirit may lead broken as my life may be I would give you every piece and then and then it says, I am available here. I am here. I am. You can have it all. And I don't know. If, is that your declaration today that God here? I am here. Am I? You can have all of me, all of me. That's what total dependence is all about saying, God, you can have all of me, all of me. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for being the great I am. We thank you for being present tonight. And God, where you are present, anything is possible. I pray, oh God, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we may know the hope of the calling of Christ Jesus. I pray, oh God, that your word tonight would be the answer to prayers that are that are being prayed. I pray that your word tonight would move each person, oh God, into purpose, into your purpose and, and into your plan. God, that your word tonight would move us into a, a greater and a deeper understanding of who you are. Most of all, a deeper relationship into a deeper relationship with you. Dispense your love, dispense your grace upon us, oh God. I pray, O oh Lord, that this word tonight, O oh God, would cause us to fall head over heels in love with you. Help us to experience all that you would have for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Um, we have about eight memory verses that we've, that we've gone through. And I don't want to go through all of them. I want to share just two memory verses. I want to share the first memory verse 
that we had, uh, that we've learned. And then I want to share this, the, the last memory verse uh, that coincides with this particular lesson. So the first memory verse that we have, that we, we started with in, in experiencing God was John chapter 15, verses 4. And this is such a powerful verse, and we're going to talk about this verse in the lesson. John chapter 15, verse 5, and it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, separated from me, separated from God, we cannot do anything that's eternally good, that's eternally lasting. And then the verse that coincides with our lesson today is Luke chapter 14, verses 33. And in the NIV, it says this. It says, any of you who, who do not give up anything, that person, he or she cannot be my disciple. And then I love the way the message paraphrase puts it. It says, simply put, simply put, if you're not willing to take what's dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye. You cannot be my disciple. That's a hard word. But God is saying it is so vitally important that you stay connected to the vine. It says, because uh, he says, if, if your love doesn't look, if your love for me doesn't look like hate in comparison, if it doesn't look like hate to everything else, says you cannot be my disciple. He says your love and your passion for following Jesus should be so complete that everything else pales in comparison to your love for God. And you might say, Pastor Jackie, I'm not there yet. And I would say, maybe you're not. But how do you get there? I think, are we still going? The Bible says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open. And it goes on to say, for everyone who asks shall receive and, and the one who seeks shall find. And the one who knocks at the door, that door will be open to him. We're on the sixth reality there's there's seven, eight realities, seven realities of God. And we're on the sixth reality. And that sixth reality pretty much states you must we as Christians, we must make major adjustments in our life if we're going to join God in what he's doing. And I don't know about you, but I want to join God. I want to be a part of what God is doing. But I can't remain where I am and get involved with what God is doing. I can't remain where I am and go where God wants to take me. And you remember a few weeks ago, we said you can't stay where you are and go where God is calling you to go. You've got to make major adjustments. And then I think it was last week where we talked about just uh, a, a number of uh, Pilgrims, a number of uh, men and women throughout the Bible that had to make major adjustments if they were going to join God in what he was doing. Namely, Noah. Noah could not continue life as usual and yet build the ark. Noah could not continue to what, what he was doing. He had to make a decision. He had to make a, 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 an adjustment in order to spend time and dedicate time to building that ark. And how about Abraham? Abraham had to leave the land of Ur in order to father a nation. He had to leave. Had Abraham uh, maintained, have Abraham, had Abraham made that decision not to go, then God would have had to use someone else. But since he made that decision to join God, Abraham's name is written as the father of many nations. Moses, he couldn't stay on the backside of the desert herding sheep. When he encountered God at the burning bush, he had a choice to make. He had a choice to make. He could have, 
He could have chosen to continue to hurt sheep or he could have chosen, in which he did, to go tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. Moses chose to honor God and in spite of his inabilities, he had to rely on God to accomplish what God wanted to do. And then we can go on and on and on. How about Jonah? Jonah had to leave his home and Jonah had to leave his preconceived notions of who the people of Nineveh was. He had to overcome, uh, Noah had to over, uh, Jonah had to overcome some major prejudices. He had to overcome some biases in order to preach to the people of Nineveh. And how about Peter? How about Andrew? How about John? They had to put down their boats. They had to put down their, their, their fishing rods in order to follow God to fish for men. We have to make major adjustments in our life. And ultimately, Jesus. Jesus had to take a 33 year long deployment from heaven to earth to relate to humanity here, to demonstrate righteousness here, to demonstrate humility, to demonstrate love, grace, and to demonstrate leadership, and the list goes on. Jesus had to leave heaven and go to a broken earth to demonstrate those things. And, and I tell you, when we truly encounter God, when we truly encounter Jesus, we must make a decision. And may, with that decision comes major adjustments in our life if we truly want to follow Jesus. I believe that deserves an amen. 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 Not only is a decision uh, to make major adjustments in our life required, but guess what? And this is what we're going to spend the rest of our time on. Not only does major adjustments have to be made, but total dependence on God is indispensable total dependence on God it's imperative to know and to do the will of God amen and God is challenging us he's challenging us to to go against our natural inclination of being independent and we all want to be independent we know the songs we know the songs about being independent you know the song, she walks like a boss. She talks like a boss. She, she moves like a boss. You know that song. We, we know those songs. We know the song, I-N-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-T. Do you know what I mean? Independ we know those songs about independence. We train up our kids to be independent. We work hard. We put our hands to the plow so that we can be independent we take pride in becoming independent but Jesus he flips the script on us he says don't be indoctrinated by the world system but be infatuated be obsessed with my system be obsessed with mine be obsessed with following after me and the adjustment the adjustments that he's talking about, he's talking about moving from doing work for God according to our own abilities, doing work for God according to our own talents and our gifts and our likes or dislikes. And he's saying being totally dependent on him, his workings, his goals, and his resources. This is a major adjustment to our thinking and to our rationale. And guess what? It is not easy. It is not easy. I want to start with a question tonight. The first question. And it says, what does complete dependence on God looks? What does that look like to you? What does complete dependence on God look like? I want you to talk back to me. I want you to drop just a few words. What does it look like in five words or less? What does complete dependence on God look like to you? I'm looking for your comments. I'm reading your comments. Sunitra said, amen. It's not easy to be completely dependent, but it's necessary. Amen. 
Kanayo said, we must make major adjustments in our life. Amen. I'm looking, what does complete dependence on God looks like, look like to you? Can I tell you, I want to pit two words against each other. Presumption and dependence. Kenny, uh, Sinitra says laying down your opinions and trusting in God. Amen. We do have to lay down our opinions. And Kenny B says, it makes me think of a baby. Amen. How a baby depend on their parents. They can't do anything themselves. They're completely dependent. And it's funny how when the baby begins to get up some age, it becomes less, that baby becomes less and less dependent on its parents, on his or her parents. And they begin to, they begin to, to gain their own independent, their own dependence. And God says, listen, let's not get too grown. Let's not grow up. I need you to be interdependent, first dependent on me, and then connected with others. Amen. Amen. But I want to, I want to, I want to just talk about this presumption and dependence thing. There's probably no greater statement that, that talks about this. No greater statement of confidence than no greater statement of confidence, confident dependence on God than what Paul states in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 it says, For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until the day he returns. Paul says, I am persuaded that what I commit to God, he is able. He is able. He's able. And I, that's what we have to get in our spirits. That's what we have to hang on to, that what we commit to God, as we commit our life to God, he is able. He is able to sustain it. He is able to take our life and advance our life. He's able. Paul says, I was persuaded. Mm -hmm. That declaration of dependence, I tell you, it is praiseworthy. Paul enjoyed the absolute certainty that God would take good care of all that he entrusted to him. Do you think like that? Do we think like that? That God, I place my family before you. I place myself before you. God, I place all of my talents before you. I place my job before you. I place my employment before you. I place all that I am and all that I ever will be. I place that before you. And I trust that what I commit to you, it's in the best hands that it can ever be in. Paul enjoyed this absolute certainty of God. Nevertheless, Paul, Paul did not presume upon God's grace, but he prayed over everything and acknowledged God in all of his ways. Um, the difference between dependence and presumption, I think it's a critical lesson for us to learn. Listen, I want to I want to paint this picture of dependence and presumption. You remember the Israelites? They were at the Jordan River. The Israelites were at the Jordan River and God miraculously dried up the Jordan River and they crossed on dry ground. Their first obstacle in the promised land in, in, in conquering, their first, uh, their first barrier or obstacle along their conquest was Jericho. And Jericho, it was an important city. It was a fortified and a formidable a city, an outpost, if you will. It protected the eastern border of Canaan. Mm -hmm. And following that strategy, God gave them a strategy. God says, listen, I want you to march around that city six times in silence. I don't want you to say a thing. I just want you to march, march around that city. I tell you, it was crazy. And then the natural mind is like, why would you want me, God, to march around a city 
This is a fortified city. There's giants behind that wall. There's warrior, there are warriors behind that wall, but yet you want us to march and make ourselves vulnerable in front of these people. Make ourselves look crazy in front of these people. But God says, listen, I just want you to honor the strategy. So they marched. And then, and then on the seventh day, on the seventh day, he says, I want you to march seven times. And then I want you to raise a hallelujah. I want you to shout and I want you to praise and I want you to sound your trumpets on that seventh day. And then they witnessed victory in that land. Walls came down. And I tell you, it was one of the greatest miracles. And it was a testament to listening and honoring the strategy of God. So they gained, so the Israelites gained that victory. They were totally dependent upon God's instructions. But yet after Jericho, a small village of Ai, Ai blocked their path. It was the next barrier. But Ai was, was not quite as uh, formidable. It was not quite as uh, fortified as Jericho was. Now listen to this. After uh, after AI, after assessing AI, after looking at their defenses, a few of Joshua's officers recommended to Joshua, listen, we don't even have to take the whole entire army. We can take AI with just a few thousand men. So after assessing AI, uh, uh, they sent out about 3,000 men only. Do you see how they shifted? their dependence on God to their presumption of God? Do you see how they shifted from being dependent to being overconfident in themselves? Like we took Jericho. It only take, it'll, it'll only take 3,000. It'll only take 2,000 to take down AI. Let's march in and, and let's take, get rid of this, this small village. With the natural eyes and the natural mind, that made sense because they just defeated Jericho. That shift, that minor, that subtle shift mm -hmm. in their thinking caused them to lose to this small city miserably. Mm -hmm. Listen, AI wasn't a threat at all. It was certainly not, not anything like Jericho. But let me read this. Joshua chapter 7, starting at verse 2. Joshua chapter 7. And I just want to read uh, 2, 3, and 4 to you really quick. It says this. It says, Joshua sent some of his men from Jericho to spy out the town, town of Ai. And when they returned, they told Joshua, listen, Joshua, there's no need for all of us to go up there. Listen, we just defeated Jericho. There's no, let, let the men rest. There's no need to send all of us up there to this small town called Ai. And when they returned, they told Joshua all of that. It, it, it ain't going to take but two or three thousand men. You know, since there are so few of them, don't make all of the people struggle to go up there to that small town. So approximately three thousand warriors were sent up there. But the, the Bible says this, the word of God says they were soundly defeated. Mm. The Israelites, they were defeated and they were paralyzed. The Bible says they were paralyzed with fear at the turn of the events mm. and their courage melted away. Their courage, the courage that they had prior to entering Jericho melted away at this small town because they were, they were soundly defeated. Israel's tragic defeat at Ai could have been uh, could have been prevented. Mm -hmm. Why? How could it have been prevented had they depended on God mm -hmm. with Ai as they depended on God with Jericho? Like Israel, our shift from dependence to presumption may almost be unnoticeable. It's sometimes inconspicuous. 
Yes, we are truly get grateful when God intervenes and, and wins important victories in our life. We're excited about that. But immediately afterwards, we venture forward on our own and our own confidence. Sometimes we get cocky. Sometimes we get the big head. Sometimes we don't depend on God for the big things. We, we, we depend on ourselves. We depend on our own wisdom and our own intellect for the small things. And then like AI, we find ourselves defeated. Can I tell you, God is challenging us to depend on him. I see you, Oliver. Oliver said, despite, my, despite the foolishness and rebellion, God has been still and is always the, what does that say? Artisan. The artisan of my entire existence. He, he, he will always be, but we have to depend on him. We have to surrender our life, surrender our all unto him. And many, many Christians, many disciples, many followers of Jesus Christ, we fall into this trap of, of presumption. We fall into the trap of being overconfident. Mm -hmm. And then we fall like AI. In fact, this was the source of Paul's frustration. He says, the foolish Galatians, he says, the Galatians are foolish, having begun in the spirit. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Galatians 3 and 3, he says, having begun in the spirit, oftentimes we begin trusting in God. When we first give our life to him, we're passionate we surrender our life to him and and then once we get a few victories under our belt mm -hmm. we begin to think that it's all because of us our spirituality and our holiness and we begin to walk we think we can walk on water and we think it's by our own self and god says listen i am the source mm -hmm. i am the source of your finances i am the source of your life depend on me Depend on me. Dependence on God is not something that we muster up in our emergencies. It is the realization. It is the realization that apart from his will, we cannot presume even the next breath that we take. It all depends on on God. I believe that's why he's taken those critical those critical things that that cause life he's taking them out of our hands like our lungs operate automatically our heart beat automatically he's taking that out of our hands and says i'm going to be the controller of those things yeah. we've got to move away from presumption to total dependence on him Remember the statements we made last week. Some of the statements we made last week. It says you cannot stay where you are and go with God. We cannot remain where we are and go with him. You cannot continue to do the things your way. We cannot continue to do things our way and expect to, comp to accomplish all God has for us. That was the first one. The second one says obedience is costly to you and it's costly to those around you your obedience is costly number one to you and it's costly to those that are connected with you that's why we have to communicate we have to stay connected with God and then the third one and this is what we'll spend the remainder of our time on it's obedience requires Total dependence on God. Total dependence on God to work through you, to work through you and I. We've got to rely on him. I want to share a couple of scriptures. And, and I said we're going to talk, just kind of talk through John chapter 15, verses 5. John 15 and, and 5. And it says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you. You will bear 
much fruit apart from me, independent of me, you cannot do anything. The Bible says you cannot do nothing. Nothing of eternal value apart from Jesus. Jesus says, really, our relationship with him is likened unto vines and branches. A vine and many branches. And he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart if a vine, if that branch is not connected to that vine, it is useless. It falls to the ground and it's it's only use is to uh, to, to, to heat up a fire or, or to throw on a fire to use as to use in your barbecue. So first of all, number one, it says, I am, I am. God says, I am. He's the great I am. For you, he says, I am the vine. I am the vine. I am the, the source of life. I am the life that runs, life runs through me into you. The vine, if you think about the vine or the trunk of the tree and the, and the branches, the water, the nutrients, all of that runs through the vine and to the branches. And if you separate yourself from me, because I'm not going to separate myself from you. I'll never leave you. The Bible says, I never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I am Emmanuel. I'm right there beside you. It says, I am your source. I am your vitality. Mm-hmm. Number two, from that verse, you need to understand that you are vital to God. Right. And you are vital to God's plan to produce what? Fruit in the earth. You are vital. I am vital. Never let anyone tell you that you're not important to God because you are. You are important to him. You need to understand that you are vital to God's plan in the earth. God says that it is important for you to remain in him because you are important too. Yes, the vine is very important, but if there are no if there are no branches, then there's no fruit. So God produces fruit through us. Yes, he can do it all. He can be the vine and he can produce everything, but God, he's interested in a relationship with you and I. He's interested in in producing through you the fruit needed on the earth. You are important. Without the branches, there will be no fruit. And if he cut all the branches from the tree, If all the branches is cut from the vine, fruit cannot grow. He needs you for that fruit and he wants you. So that's why he says, abide in me, remain in me as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abides in him. The branches are utterly dependent on the vine for its source of nutrients. The branches are utterly Can you see that picture? The branches connected to the vine, it's life. But when it's disconnected, it's disconnected from the power source. It's disconnected from the nutrients. And God is saying, you are my branches. Please stay connected to me. Because when you produce fruit, you produce fruit for others. He says, I am the life and through me, you have life and through you, others will have life. That's how it works. We're, we're, we're interdependent on each other. First God, and we're interdependent on one another says some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. Amen. Amen. All spiritual fruitfulness can be credited to a mutual relationship with Christ and his disciples. This this connection is essential. This connection is vital. And ultimately, without Christ, there is no spiritual life or hope of eternal reward. And that's found in John chapter 14, verses 6. We have to stay connected with Jesus. I want to pose another question to you. 
What does your abiding in Christ look like? What does your attachment to Jesus, what does it look like? What does you being a branch connected to the vine, what does that look like? What does it look like? Another verse that displays the importance of our, our, our connection with him, that displays the importance of our total dependence on him, is from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. And it says this, Do not fear. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And man, as I begin to just kind of study that out, I, I have uh, this application. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, application uh, for studying. Got tons and tons of uh, commentaries in it, and and all kinds of resources. It's called Logos. And as I begin to study this particular scripture, it just kind of stood out. It says, you know, um, there's so many do not fears in the Bible. To uh, a variety of do not fears in the Bible. As a matter of fact, do not fear out of the do nots. It's one of the most repeated in the Bible. Do not fear. God did not intend for his people to be preoccupied with anxiety. God did not. Yes, yes, yes. Logos. God did not fear uh, for his people to be preoccupied with worry with anxiety, with apprehension, with fear. He did not intend for those things to paralyze us. But guess what? They do. They do. He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For he is with me. Yes. He is right there beside me. The Bible isn't saying that, that, that there's nothing scary, so don't be afraid. Let's just keep it real. Life is scary sometimes. That's right. There's some, there's some, if, I, can I just be real honest with you? If I see someone puke, <laughs> if I see someone throw up, that scares me. I don't want to be around that. Can I just be honest? I'm going to find someone to help that person that's throwing up. I'm not going to leave you by yourself. I'm going to find someone to help you. No, no, no. God is, God is like, please, you don't have to fear. I want you to look at your fear and walk through your fear because oftentimes my purpose is on the other side of what you're afraid of. And he says, you don't have to be. If you connect with me, I want you to walk through that fear. He says, I, I, I prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies. I tell you, God is right there. He says, I've got you. All you've got to do is keep putting one foot in front of the other. He says, he says um, um, every time God says, do not be afraid, he gives a reason that you shouldn't be. It's followed by... It's followed by actions that God will. It's followed by actions that God says, listen, do not be afraid because. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see your deliverance. He says, I will bring that to you today. He says, do not be afraid. Why? Because the Lord your God himself will fight for you. He says, I won't send an angel I won't send another person. He says, I myself will fight for you. That's why you don't have to be afraid. He goes on to say, do not be afraid. I already have given you, the, I, I, I've, I've already given the land into your hands. This is what he was telling Joshua. He says, listen, there's some, there some things from the natural eye that strike fear in our heart. But he says, I want you to begin to look from your spiritual eyes. I want you to begin to walk by faith and not by sight. I want you to look what's, what scares you in the face and say, my God is bigger. My God has my back. My God, the Holy Spirit is inside of me. That's
do the work and the will of God. So I'm marching through the thing that looks scary to me. God says, do not be afraid. And we can continue to examine and dissect the scriptures that substantiate our need to be connected with him. As we're connected, he gives us courage and he gives us boldness. He says, I am God and there is none like me. My purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. That's coming out of Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9. He says, I am God and there's none beside me. There's none like me. My purpose will stand. He says, I will do all that I please. And when we step into what God is already doing, we can believe that what he started, he's capable, capable of finishing. Amen. I want to ask you another question. I want to ask you another question. Why? Why must you, why must we totally depend on God to work through us? I'll say that again. Why must, in, in order to do his will, why must we totally depend on him to work through us? I want, I want to see your answers. I want to see your responses. Why must we, to do anything eternally good, why must we depend on him? Why must we? So if we, was in a, if we were in a room and I, and I could see you, I might say, hey, Jamil, what, what are your thoughts on that? I may put you on the spot. But I can't put you on the spot right now. So I'm just hoping that you would connect and that you would respond, drop your comments in. Sinitra said, because of this old flesh. Absolutely. This, there's a war. There's a war between our flesh and our spirit, man. Who will win? There's, a, there's an old saying. There's an old saying. Whoever you feed the most grows the most. So if I feed my flesh, my flesh is going to overpower my spirit. But if I begin to feed my spirit man, my spirit man is going to rise up and say, flesh, be still in Jesus name. Christine says our flesh is not capable. Absolutely. Our flesh will fail us every time. So we must depend on God. Without God at work in us, we cannot produce anything we cannot produce anything eternally fruitful we cannot produce kingdom fruit if you will if we don't have God inside of us think about that branch that's been cut from the vine it dries up and it becomes firewood amen it becomes firewood it's burnt up Kenny B says there is no good in us anyway we must depend on the goodness of God. We have to depend on his righteousness. Absolutely. He says, the Bible tells us our heart is a deceitful wickedness. Who can know it? I tell you, if we depend and rely on our heart, it'll lead us astray sometimes. We have to depend on the spirit of God. That's right. Debbie said, spirit over flesh. Spirit over flesh. It reminds me of that rapper. He says, uh, Money, um, uh, what is God over money? God over money, God over flesh, amen. That Christian rapper, what's his name? Um, Bizzle, Bizzle. He says, God over money, and we've got to say, Spirit over flesh, God over our flesh. We've got to feed our spirit man so our spirit man will lead us rather than our flesh, rather than our flesh. Tierra said, because God creates us, he knows every detail about us, our fears, our weaknesses, our strength. I'm a cash app UT. That's worthy of a cash app by $10, a $10 offering right there. 20 A $20 offering? Come, bring it down a little lower. That's good. That's good. Um, when God purposes to do something in us, it is him that guarantees the outcome. So when we do things on our own, listen, and it fails, that's probably what we deserve. But when we connect with God and accomplishes his will, it's his responsibility for the outcome. 
And I tell you, I'd rather have God's outcome than my outcome. I'd rather have God's outcome than your outcome. I'd rather have God's results than what Jackie can produce. And I, and I pray that that's your heart as well, that we get God results. Amen. There's a story I want to share. Um, and I have time. There's a story in the book that I want to share with you really quick. And I think it's a really good story um, out of the book, Experiencing God. And it says once um, a church, man, that they had been praying, oh, God, how can we reach our community? How can we reach our community? How can I how can we uh, reach our community and become a great church in our community? And I tell you, they through prayer, through waiting and through listening, God led them to start a bus ministry and to provide transportation for the children and the adults to come to church. And, and don't you know that their ministry began to thrive, their church began to multiply into a great church. And I tell you, uh, this church, they were flattered when people all over the country begin to ask, what are you doing to grow so rapidly? I tell you, they prayed, they waited, and then they had the courage to, to go out and just begin to purchase buses so that they can, can, can reach their neighborhood, reach their community. They even wrote a book on how to build churches through a bus ministry. So thousands of churches begin to buy buses to reach their community. Thousands of church, they begin to use the same methodology, same methodology to grow their church. What do you think happened? What do you think happened to those other churches? Later on, many of the same churches that purchased buses, they said, this didn't work for us. And they begin to sell those buses. Guess what? It never works. He works. The me it's not in the methods. It's in our connection and our relationship with God. It never works. He works. The method isn't what accomplishes the will of God. The key to accomplishing God's purposes is his connection, your connection with him. The key is your relationship with a person, and that's the person of Jesus. When you want, when we want to know what God wants for us to reach our city, to reach our community, we can't ask, we can't go out and start asking everyone else. We have to ask him. We have to connect with him because he gives us the answer. It's his church. Right. It's his plan. It's his purpose. And if we want to know his plan and his purpose, we've got to connect with him. Right. We've got to connect with him. Amen. When he tells you, don't be surprised if you don't find any other churches. The story says, don't, don't be surprised if you don't find any other churches doing it the same way. Because he didn't call us, he didn't call City Mission, he didn't call you, I don't know what church you, you're attending, but he didn't call us to do everything everybody else is doing. He created us uniquely and he designed us uniquely to impact this community and to impact this city. And if he decides to extend this ministry further, it's not going to be because of Jackie, it's not going to be because of anyone else, it's going to be because of him and us hearing him and responding to him. And I would say that to you, that if we want, if you want to do anything significant, don't go beat down another pastor's door. And don't, don't, get on, don't get on the phone with the psychic hotline. We've got to get on our knees and begin to ask, seek, and knock. He says, as you ask, he's going to answer. As you seek, you'll find. And he says, as you knock on that door, he's going to swing it wide open. And he says, welcome in. Welcome in. Let's have a, let's have a conversation. Amen. And number one, let me do more talking than you do. Because my voice is more important than your voice. 
And I want to, I want to, I want to speak to you in a way that you would only know it's, it's, it's me. He says, my sheep, they hear my voice and they follow me. God, to hear your voice. Give City Mission ears to hear your voice as you begin to speak to us. And I pray, oh God, that you would give your people, your Christians, your disciples, give us an ear to hear you. I pray, oh Lord, that you would shut the noise out to every wolf that may attempt to speak to us. Every, every, every voice of the enemy that may try to sidetrack us. I pray, oh Lord, that you would tune our ears to your frequency, to the frequency of your voice. And as we begin to move in the direction of your voice, I pray, O oh Lord, that you'll continue to, to show up and show out. He says, if you want, if God wants you to know him, you can't follow someone else's plan. You've got to follow God's plan. You lead the relationship with God. And if you lead, if you leave, if we lead the relationship with God and go after methods or programs, he likens that into spiritual adultery. Because he's a jealous God. And he wants all of you. He wants all of me. He wants all of City Mission. He wants all of us. Third question. I know we're, we're, we've got 10 more minutes, nine more minutes. Where do you usually go to find out how to accomplish God's purpose for your life? Where do you typically, typically go? Do you typically run to the pastor? He's a, he or she is a good source. Do you typically run to mom or dad? They potentially could be a good source. Do you turn on the TV and do you turn to, you know, many of the pastors, the mega churches? Do you turn and do you try to listen for a word from them? Where do you turn to find God's purpose for you, to find God's purpose for your family? Where do you turn? Can I suggest one thing to you? Let's turn to the word of God. And let the word of God lead us into a conversation with God. And as we fall on our, our knees, let's fall on our knees over an open Bible and begin to pray God's word. Yes, that's right, Debbie. On my knees and in his word. Let's fall on our knees over an open Bible. This is what I'm challenging you. I'm challenging myself. Let's begin on our knees. While running to the pastor is an option, the option, the first option is running to God. Falling on our knees over an open Bible and begin to cry out, God, your word says you are the word. You are the word. And as I open your word, I am inviting myself into a relationship with you because you said you are the living word. The word of God carries the same authority today as it did when the word of God was spoken. So we begin to open the word of God. We are encountering God. That's how powerful the word is. But all too often we'd rather read this book and that book and, and listen to this sermon or this sermon or this. And I'm not saying those things are wrong, but I'm saying to root and ground yourself. It's in God's word first and foremost. That's where we draw our strength and our encouragement. Because all too often we can be led astray. The, the, the word of God even says in the last days, even the elect would be led astray. There's so many false voices out there today. You need to know what's truth. And the only way we're going to be able to decipher between false and true is if we understand the word for ourselves. We've got to get back 
into the word of God. And we've got to begin to just open the pages. And I'm not challenging you to read the entire Bible in one day or one month or one, one year for that matter. I'm saying start today. Just reading a couple of scriptures and saying, God, speak to me through your word. That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. You can't put that on anyone else. It's our responsibility to open God's word and begin to ask God, God, I want to know you more. I want to know what your word is saying in this season. Give me a revelation of your word. God, I want new wine. I want a new revelation. Help me to understand where I need to go. Help me to understand where I am currently, God. And then take me where you want me to go. Hmm. What's very important for you to know in seeking God's will is what God wants you to do right where you are. Methods and programs have their place, but the word of God is where we need to start. I want to, uh, I want to share one last thing and then we'll close for tonight. What's the importance of waiting on God What's the importance of waiting on God? The scripture says, wait upon the Lord. What's the importance of waiting on God? Sunitra says, so that we will not miss God. I think oftentimes we can get ahead of God. We can, we can run out ahead of God. We can be walking in step with God and get overconfident or we can get presumptuous, if you will. And, and, and we can launch out before God says go. Or we can wait and wait and wait and get behind God. What we want to do is, is, is be in the heartbeat, be in the footsteps of God. The Bible tells us in Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 31, it says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. And then it says, They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's important to wait. Don't move too quickly. Don't move too slowly. Because that can be tragic. And when you move, you want to move in confident expectation that God is in it. Mm -hmm. Because if you know that you're walking with God, you tend to, to lift your head up, put your shoulders back, and you're confident that you've made the right decision, that you prayed, that you felt that, 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 that what you prayed about has been validated through God's word and, and maybe someone else validated your word or confirmed that word and now you're moving out on what you believe God has said. It's a confident expectation. Can I say one other thing about waiting? You may think that waiting is passive and, ina and inactive. It's not. Waiting on the Lord is anything but inactive. When you wait, can I tell you, pray with passion to know him. While you wait, pray with purpose. Pray saying, God, help me to know your ways. So while we're waiting, we're not waiting idly by. We're praying while we're waiting. Not only that, we're watching. We're being watchful. We're watching the circumstances and, and we're asking God, Lord, interpret these circumstances for me. Reveal your perspective to me. While we're waiting, guess what? We're sharing. We're sharing with other believers to find out what God is saying. We're, we're, we're fellowshipping with other believers. We're not camped out like a monk in the basement alone. And, 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 and I'm, not, I'm not excluding that. I'm just saying when you wait, it's more than just 
hunkering down in a basement and not talking to anyone and isolating yourself for for weeks and months. No. No, you're still you're doing the last thing you know God told you to do. And, and unless he told you to stop. No, you're, you're being watchful. You're waiting. You're being active. You're, you're expecting God to speak and say, yes, it's time. There's an expectation. By waiting, this is what I'll leave you with. By waiting, you shift the responsibility of the outcome to God where it belongs. By waiting. When God gives you specific guidance, he will do more through you in days and weeks than you can accomplish in a year by yourself, with your abilities, with your talent, with your money. I'll say that again. By waiting on God, you shift the responsibility of the outcome on God where it belongs and when you get, when God gives you spe specific directions to move, timing to move, he will do more through you, through this ministry, in days and weeks, than we could ever accomplish, than you could ever accomplish in years of labor on your own. That's the importance of waiting. That's the importance of, of being totally dependent on him. Amen. Without the Holy Spirit, we miss it every time. Right. We have to depend on the Holy Spirit living inside of us for our for the Christians I'm talking to. The Holy Spirit, he's a, he's the paraclete. He comes along and he enables us. He guides us and he speaks to us. The Holy Spirit is God. Amen. Amen. Man. I wish we had more time, but we are out of time. And uh, being totally, being totally dependent on God is where we need to be if you want to accomplish the purposes of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Before we pray, I just want to tell you thank you for for joining us today. Um, I, I I pray that the word of God spoke to you. I want to encourage you to, to get in your word, read your word, study your word, and fall in love with Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, join us tomorrow. If you're, if you're available tomorrow, um, Thursday at, seven, at 1900, 7 p.m., please join us. We have our corporate prayer, our intercessory prayer at 7 o'clock, and we do that on Zoom. If you want to be a part of that, drop a message to us. Um, and, and, and yes, um, Sunday, Sunday, again, we're still, uh, our capacity is not where it is because of some of the restrictions. And so if you want to join us on Sunday, we're encouraging you to sign up. You can find the sign up on our Facebook page. We'll even drop the sign up link, um, um, in the comment section here, but we're encouraging you to sign up and we're going to have a fantastic time in the Lord. This Sunday is first Sunday. We'll be taking our communion. So we look forward to uh, just uh, taking communion with you. Amen. We love you. And uh, we'll, let's pray and then, and then we'll end. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for your word tonight. God, we thank you for every person who tuned in. I pray, oh Lord, that they heard your voice. Although they saw Jackie's face, I pray, O oh Lord, that it was your voice that they heard. I pray, O oh Lord, that your voice set each and every person on assignment. I pray, O oh Lord, that throughout this week, we would meditate on your word. And God, we would experience all that you have to offer. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Until next time, God bless you. We'll see you um, either Thursday or we'll see you Sunday. Amen. Amen.